Social inclusion is key to sustainable economic growth. Understanding this, Nigeria Office hosted a 2018 conference focused on the theme, The Business Case for Financial Inclusion. This was part of activities to mark its 10th anniversary and also brought together stakeholders in the financial services and tech ecosystem to explore the prospects for financial inclusion in Africa's most populous nation. In his opening address, the chairman of EFINA Nigeria, Mr. Shegun Akerele, shared the essence of the forum. On behalf of EFINA, on behalf of our board, our donors, to welcome you to today's event. As, you, as you've been told, we are a financial sector development company, and we are hoping to use this event and many more like it to bring attention to financial inclusion in Nigeria. Now, the theme of today's event is uh, the business case for financial inclusion. So, essentially, what we believe is that for financial inclusion to take root, there has to be a, a business um, initiative behind it. It cannot simply just be funded by the government and donors. So, we're hoping to continue the conversations that we have already begun and try and highlight some of the main issues around this area. Giving the keynote address on behalf of the Governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, the Deputy Director of Development Finance, Mr. Osita Nwashinobi, shared the key steps taken through the Financial Inclusion Plan to reduce Nigeria's exclusion level to 20% by 2020. It is important that I mention that the Nigeria Financial Inclusion Strategy was recently reviewed and the exercise revealed that some assumptions in the original strategy, such as need to open more branches of banks and microfinance banks, are no longer in vogue due to technological innovation and advancement. It identified women, youth, rural areas, northern regions, and MSMEs as the most excluded sectors of the Nigerian population. The usual high exclusion rates among the groups has been ascribed to a number of factors, such as cultural barriers to uptake, to uptake of financial products, difficulties in offering profitable services, worsening levels of unemployment, security challenges, and continuing large share of the informal sector. It is pertinent to add here that five priorities that emerged from the recent review of the strategy as most crucial to increasing financial uh, inclusion in Nigeria in future years include conducive environment for the expansion of uh, digital financial uh, services, supporting the rapid growth of agent networks with nationwide reach, addressing KYC hurdles to opening and operating a bank account, creating an appropriate environment conducive for market operators to serve the most excluded, adopting cashless payment channels, particularly in government to person and person to government payments. We will also reinforce our supervision and regulation of financial institutions to ensure delivery of affordable and sustainable services to Nigerians. I want to reassure you that we will leave no stone unturned in ensuring a credible reliable and effective payment system, as well as a stable and sound financial system in view of their strategic significance for financial inclusion. Ladies and gentlemen, we are poised as a bank to ensure that we reach the target of 20% exclusion rate by 2020. This will be supported by massive agent rollout under the shared agent network expansion facility implementation of approved national identity management framework, as well as the micro-insurance and micro-pension services, collective investment schemes, and extensive collaborative programs within, with government and development partners, amongst others. Anup Singh of Microsave gave an overview of the progress in the Indian Financial Inclusion Plan and how the hurdles were addressed as a lesson for Nigeria. One thing that worked in favor of financial inclusion and in favor of poor was the collaboration that happened between the different agencies that are there. Because at times we have seen that somehow um, financial inclusion is, becomes a central bank priority only. I don't think so that it will work in that way. So India was able to move from being the, highest, being the country with highest number of poor 
unfortunately nigeria holds that distinction right now and it's up to us to decide what would be the way forward how would we want to take it panelists at the events harped on the need for financial literacy the right policy environment products and services and also the customer focus for innovation in driving financial inclusion no matter how much you try to push financial inclusion, if people don't understand mm. the products and services and they aren't mm. able to access them, they don't know what they need, you're finding people are borrowing without having the capacity to pay back. Mm. So we've got to be very careful to ensure that they are educated. I think the first thing is the environment. The environment needs to be conducive to do business in and to create anything that's going to be sustainable within that environment. So we need the policy from the regulator side. We need the, legis the comparable legislation as well in, in some cases, especially when we're talking about financial services, fraud, cybersecurity, privacy, et cetera, et cetera. I think the second thing, and I think a lot of uh, my colleagues have mentioned this as well, is the issue about um, the right products and services to meet the needs of the customers. But I, we also need to understand who these customers are. Other than their demographic profiles in terms of gender, location, there are also deeper issues in terms of their psychometric and psychographic attributes, as well as their behavioral attributes as well. So we have what we call um, a customer segmentation framework that we did, and that's sort of deciding on a sort of introducing six archetypes into the environment that would help not only develop products, but also communicate and engage with the different personas that we have in the market. I think the third area also is the issue of the supply side. How do we ensure that we get to the last mile in an affordable manner? And that's where the agents come in as well. Agent viability and the economics in general is a big problem because we can create agents, but if we don't have sufficient transactions sitting on top of those agent networks and economies, economies of scale generally, then those agents will not be sustainable in the future. What we need to understand is, is with financial inclusion, as many people as possible contributing solutions specific to their grouping specific to specific use cases is the way that we actually get to solve the problem. What doesn't help is to build new monopolies. Um, and I think that's one thing that, you know, in general, the ecosystem has to veer away from. We cannot build a financial services ecosystem for investors. It has to be built in the public interest. And if investors' interest and the public interest um, are not aligned, then we have to prioritize the public interest and investors can take their money and go. Um, that's my point of view. So I think that's something that we have to continue to emphasize to these investors that you are not our priority as we build financial inclusion. If you want to, to invest, um, you should. We think if you align with the public interest, you will still make money but we cannot prioritize um, you when it comes to building solutions to solve financial inclusion. The chairman of EFINA Nigeria, Mr. Segun Akerele, speaks on the three-year strategy for Nigeria and the planned FinTech Challenge Fund in the country. We had a look at um, our, our areas of focus, and we decided that we chose three areas. We're going to focus on the young people, on women, and on the North. Because if you look at the numbers, those are the three key areas. For the young, the, the, the number of, of exclusion amongst the young is very, very high. In the north, it's very, very high. And also for women as well. That's what informed the new strategy. So in terms of the FINA FinTech Challenge Fund, uh, tell us a bit about it. And of course, how are the FinTech players already responding to this uh, provision that you're making now? The, objective of the fund is to try and support innovation. We all, we've been here all day, we, we, we see that innovation is very important in, in financial inclusion. It helps things to be cheaper, to be more effective. We can, we can better move products to remote areas through innovation. So the, so the general idea is just to support companies with innovative products that can help us with the drive for financial inclusion. Mr. Ni Yajau, Executive Director, Nigeria Interbank Settlement System, 
and Mr. Osita Mwasinobi of the CBN speak further on the Payment Service Bank and the Financial Inclusion Plan. The guideline for Payment Services Bank was released late last week by the Central Bank. And if you go through that document, there are so many participants, so many other people who have now been allowed to play in the, payments, in the, in the payment system in, the, in that designation of Payment Services Bank. FMCGs, all those retail chains all over the country cannot play. Uh, even bodies like Nipost cannot apply for the license. Uh, mobile money companies cannot apply through their subsidiaries. So really, I, I love the, that, that guideline because it has, opened, it has opened the payment space so well to everybody that is ready to come and, to come and play because uh, financial inclusion is a problem. And uh, we say in every problem there's an opportunity. Because there's a problem that needs to be solved. People have to solve those problems. Those that solve problems can solve them in a way that they, they make profit from it. And that's the whole idea. So I'm looking forward to having many of those entities coming forward to CBN to apply for the payment services license and then to begin to play. We've seen what's going on in India with that, with that whole idea. So really whoever gets the license can even sit down over the net or go to India to see how they're able to do it and to grow the business. I'm so positive that with that, the payment service bank scheme, along with this other SANEP and all that we're working on, I think the next uh, one or two years, we we'll find it very exciting in payments and in, and in the financial service industry in Nigeria. Like I said in that uh, the presentation, number one was there are certain obvious um, issues in terms of um, 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 looking at the banks and microfinance bank having more branches and all of that. And we are saying that, look, because of technology and other you know, uh, emerging trends and issues coming up, that now insisting that they, will, they would have to have branches across the Federation may not be able to advance this cost much further. Now, certain flag points were also identified, areas we really needed to look at in terms of uh, the youth, the women, um, the set, uh, certain regions of the country that uh, really uh, 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 exhibiting very high rate of exclusion. Now, and if you look at um, what the central bank has done in recent times, you know, in trying to incorporate technology, we came up with um, what we call the shared agent uh, network expansion facility. And the essence of this facility is to incentivize and also to allow the super agents and mobile money uh, agents to have access to finance so that they will be able to uh, roll out um, agent networks across the 774 local governments of the country. The whole essence is to see how we can capture more persons into uh, the financial uh, architecture uh, as a means of uh, reaching the 20% uh, percent, uh, exclusion rate by 2020. For Nigeria to achieve scale in the financial inclusion like India, it must give special consideration to identity management, effective implementation of the payment service bank model, improve collaboration between banks, fintechs and other service providers to achieve sustainable economic growth.